Amen. God is so good. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, I'm Pastor Freddie. I'm the senior pastor here at Grace Restoration Church, and um, I'm grateful for yet another encounter with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, we don't just come here to have church. Y'all, y'all get quiet on me. Maybe, maybe some of y'all expected to just have church today, but this is not what we come to do. Amen. We come to have an encounter with God. Yes. Yes. That's what we come to do. And that's why every Sunday is just as great as the last one. Right. And we look forward to the next one. Because sometimes if you just come to have church, you get burnt out on church. Anybody ever been burnt out with church before? And you say, I just have church at home. I, I could do this. I could be bored at the house. I'm already thinking about what's going on at the house. I might as well stay at the house. Amen. But when you come to seek an encounter, it's just a different atmosphere that you walk into that changes you before you leave. And when you leave, you can't wait till you get back. Yes. Hallelujah. So, so I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, listen, God has been doing some amazing things in this ministry. And, and, and we're just going to keep on believing God to continue to, uh, to manifest his glory over it. So this whole, I, what he's released to me to do you guys know these last couple of Sundays I've been preaching out of Acts. And, um, and he was, he's, just keep, he's keeping me there. He's keeping me in the book of Acts. So I realized that after preaching in, what was it, chapter 12 and chapter 16, as I, I said, Lord, if you want me to stay in Acts, I better go back to chapter 1. And let's go and do this thing right. Let's go ahead and get from the beginning and, and work our way through it. Amen. And so, um, so I went to chapter one in the book of Acts, y'all, and I've been reading it and, and looking over it. He showed me some unique stuff that I've never seen before um, in this text. And I want to share that with y'all today. So we're going to be going. These are the scriptural references we're going to be using today. Amen. And so if you want to screenshot them, write them down, whatever it is. Now, remember, I give you what God gives me. Amen. Amen. I give you what God gives me. But that what he gives me is not intended to be the, to the, the what's the word, the total totality of the word. Why is that? Because he wants you to go and study to show thyself approved. Amen. So I'm giving you scripture references. I'm giving you the downloads that he gave to me. And then I want you to take these things home and go deeper. Amen. 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 So we're going to start in chapter one of the book of Acts. We're going to be reading verses 15 through 17. If you all don't mind standing for the reading of God's word. I'm reading from the NIV version here. Amen. So starting in verse 15, it says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. And let me skip up down to uh, verse 21. It says, therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And so they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. And then they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. And so I want to preach to you guys from a message title, when no was the best thing for me. When no was the best thing for me. You guys may be seated. See, we, we've probably read this story. Some of y'all may, may be familiar with this story. And with this story, 99 times out of 100, we focused on who was actually selected to be the 12th disciple or apostle. And so as I was reading this text and I'm thinking about it, I said, Lord, we, we know this story. This is an easy read. They lost one. They had to pick up one. They had two choices. They had to pick between the two. And we've preached sermons time and time again about casting of lots. 
you know, we've preached those sermons and said, Lord, what is so significant about this text that you want me to pull out um, as, we, as we're studying this, this, this uh, scripture? And he says, don't focus on the obvious. I want you to go deeper. So I had to go deeper. And as I'm going deeper, I'm, I'm looking at the other person that was not chosen. Bar Sabbath. I'm looking at why he was not chosen. And so because he was not chosen, there's not much to say about him. Because in the natural realm, being not chosen means you're really not that important to the people who did the selection. So he says, I want you to focus on him. I want you to go deeper, do some research on him so that you get a better understanding of what it is I want you to tell my people. So I did that. I did some research on him, and I'm going to release some of that to you guys today. Have you ever been in a situation where you wanted to be picked? You wanted to be chosen. You wanted to be selected about something. I know we got some people in here nodding y'all head. I see almost everybody here doing this here. You wanted that job. You wanted that relationship. You wanted that house. You wanted whatever it was you wanted, and you aligned yourself as best you could to be chosen. Only to, be fi only to find out that they gave that to somebody else. Y'all can be quiet if you want to. But I, know, I know about 95% of us in here been in that situation at least once. 100%. All of, uh, amen. If we're going to keep it real. All of us have been in a situation where we wanted something so bad. We positioned ourselves for that moment. We prayed about it. We declared and decreed. We did all the stuff that we supposed to do as children of God. But then when the time came and we expected to hear our name called, somebody else's name was called. My God, my God. Mm, mm, mm. It's disheartening when you want something so bad. And all you can think about is if I go hard enough at it. Right? If I go hard enough for because that's what the world teaches you, man, you got to go hard or go home, right? If you want it bad enough, you go hard. But then find out that it was really for somebody else. But this is one thing that God showed me. The Bible says that people perish for a lack of knowledge. And what I didn't know is that it wasn't so much that God didn't want to bless you it was that he had much better for you down the line. Y'all got to get that. Because hmm. if I had gotten what I asked for, I would have been praising God for giving me good. Right? I'm going to say that part again before I move on. If I had gotten what I asked for, I would have been praising God for giving me good. When in reality, his plans for me were actually great. Sometimes we can praise God for the wrong thing. Yes. I'm praising God because I got good, but God is sitting back saying, I really want you to have great. So we end up praising him for the wrong thing. And then when good turns bad, we're ready to blame God. So the enemy will help you have a pity party and question yourself about your value to God because what we don't remember is according to his promises, he will not withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly. See, the enemy wants you to forget the scripture. He wants you to forget God's promises. And so when you're sulking about what you didn't get, about how somebody else got it, but you feel like you were more qualified than they were, your resume looks better than them. Y'all know, know how we go through those moments. And the enemy will sit right there with you and he will make you forget the promise of God that I will not withhold any good thing from you for those that walk uprightly. All he wants to do is pat you on your back while you're over there in, in your slumber. The Bible also says that he who knows how to give good gifts, come on somebody, as messed up as you are, you know how to give a good gift to your kids, right? He says, how much more can I give to you as your father in heaven? You, you know how to give good gifts to your kids, right? You know what it is they want for Christmas. You know what it is they want for their birthday. And you make sure you give them that and then some. But if you can do that, as messed up as you are, come on, somebody. How much more can our Father in heaven, who's perfect, can do for you? That's right. So the enemy wants you to forget all of these things so that way you begin to learn how to live a life of blaming God for what you don't get. And then pat yourself on the back for what you do get. 
So y'all don't want to admit that, but sometimes we pat ourselves on the back because we subconsciously counted God out because he didn't give us what we wanted the last time we asked for something. So now we all of a sudden think that we did it in our own might. Hmm. So if, if we don't learn how to rest on the fact that God will never withhold his best from us, we'll always be motivated to overcome inadequacy in areas we're not even called to instead of thriving where the Lord wants us to be. So we'll spend so much time trying to become adequate in areas where God doesn't even want us to be that we're missing and we're losing focus on the fact that God already has something predestined for me to thrive in. I should be focusing on that instead of pouting on the fact that I'm not good enough here. And some people spend years and years and years trying to become better at something that God never called them to do and then they miss out on their calling altogether. Mm, mm, mm. I've been through there. I've been there. I've been that guy. So I, I can speak from experience. So for years, after, after coming to Christ for years, I've had to convince myself that I was worthy of God's blessings. I've had to convince myself that I'm not just another Christian. Right? Y'all ever been there before? You have to convince yourself that you're special in God's eye because you haven't received the yes in the areas where you wanted the yes, but you're not really familiar with the fact that he's not going to withhold any good thing from you, but it's just what you want. Yeah, right? I want what I want when I want it. And because I don't get what I want, I'm pouting. And if I don't get what I want, God must not be real. And if I don't get what I want, then he must not love me. If I don't get what I want, I must have sinned somewhere. If I don't get what I want, I must be out of God's will. Come on, somebody. I know I'm talking to somebody in here today. All of that. We find reasons to, to, to call ourselves inadequate. We find reasons to invalidate who we are in Christ based on us not getting our fleshly desires. And he's saying, listen, if you just fall back for a minute, and recognize my plan for you is perfect. Stop basing your relationship on me with you getting whatever it is you want. Yeah. When I, you know what I'm saying? When I was a child, I, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became older, I set aside childish things. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to stay in the word this morning. Yes. So God is saying, I need you to grow up a little bit and stop pouting every time you don't get what you want. Amen. Any parents ever said that to your kids before? I know I didn't have to say it before. Be grateful for what you have. Right. And stop pouting over what you can't have. Not even realizing that what it is they pouting for, we probably already bought it anyway. <laughs> and they don't even realize it, but they just pouting any doggone way. Yeah, that's that's that's, you know, parenting. That's what that's, that's what it's about. Hmm. And so what I've learned is I've learned to pray differently. Because if something is not meant for me to have, I don't want it. I don't want what I'm not meant to have because God did not equip me to carry that mantle. That belongs to somebody else. So just as much as I don't want nobody taking my blessing, I don't want to take somebody else's blessing. And God has equipped me to carry a specific mantle. And if he's equipped me to carry that mantle, that's the one that I want. But if he did not carry me to carry, uh, bless me to carry your blessing, I don't want it. Because your blessing is going to be my burden. That just hit. It just hit. That just hit. I don't want to carry your blessing, brother, because your blessing is my burden. Why is it my burden? Because he gave me a totally different yoke to carry. He gave me a totally different blessing that I'm prepared for. He, he, he went before us and prepared us for a place. He prepared us for a blessing, prepared us for a purpose. And I have a lane I got to stay in in order to receive my blessing. And if I get outside of my lane trying to get in your lane, we're going to both trip up and fall. Come on, somebody. Y'all know how I work on the racetrack. Everybody has a lane. And when you cross over into somebody else's lane, tragedy occurs. Amen. So as long as we stay in our lane and recognize that this is what I wanted, but God didn't allow me to have it. He's in control of all things, but he did not let me have this. This must be somebody else's blessing. So, so let me just keep on running. Let me just keep on thriving. Mm -mm -mm. So I've learned to be okay with doors closing in my face. I've learned to be okay with them saying that they're going with another candidate. I've learned to be okay with not getting everything I want because God's promise is that what he has for me, 
is just for me. Come on, somebody. And it's excellent and it's perfect and it will fulfill every desire in me that I have. Come on, somebody. I want y'all to look at one person and tell them denial is not rejection. Denial is not rejection. Denial is not rejection. We get so sensitive sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Y'all know how we do. We get a little bit of denial. We call it rejection. They must not like me. It must be something wrong with my hair. Y'all know we take stuff personally. I got a little bit of it. I don't got that much. Come on. But we take everything personally. How can we have a relationship with God, the one that knows what's best for us, and have a healthy relationship with him if we take no personally every time he says no? We got to learn how to trust him in the good and in the bad. We got to learn how to trust him on the mountaintops and the valley lows. We got to learn to trust God in the yeses and the mm -mm -mm. So when we get all this stuff out of the way that look good, but ain't God, you can now be propelled into what God has for you. Are y'all with me? So, so I've learned I have to keep my feelings in check and look at what I was denied and remember God's promise to me that says I'm aiming too small. Man, y'all got to get this. I'm, and I'm, I'm going to transition in a minute, but y'all got to get this. When you get denied something that you really want, you got to look that thing in the face. You know what? I was denied because I'm aiming too small. Yeah. It's a mindset shift that we got to have and get an attitude with it. How dare I? Subject myself to something so minute. I thought this was of God, but reality is God said no. So that must mean there's something greater for me somewhere else. How dare I charge myself too small and think that this is the best of what God has for me? Anybody ever thought they knew the best of what God had for you and was wrong? Come on. Come on, somebody. Goodness gracious. He says that my, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are are not your ways. Come on, somebody. And so what he's saying to you is that even at your best, the best dream you could put together, the best plan you could put together, he said, I'm higher than that. That's right. So when you think you got him figured out, oh, this is definitely what God wants for me to do. This is God's bless blessings for my life. He's saying, nope, you're aiming too small. Yeah. Yeah, amen. You gave your best shot, but you're aiming too small. I'm up here. Come on up a little higher. I'm up here. And I tell you what, we, we experienced that with this ministry because in the beginning, I'm not about to go through Genesis, I'm just saying. <laughs> in the beginning, when this ministry first started, amen, God gave us a vision. He gave me and my wife a vision. But as we started to move in that vision, as we started to walk into it, as we started to conquer certain stepping stones to get to where we are now, he started releasing more. So here we are, back when we first started ministry, we thought that, okay, this is what God wants us to do. This is the extent of it. We didn't figure God out, and this is what he wants. But then he's like, no, 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 no. I don't want you to just have a community. Because if I told you what I wanted you to have in the beginning, you would have ran. You would have turned your back and said, this is too crazy. This is too great. There's nothing that we could do. So he gave us just enough that we had the faith to believe in. And he says, now walk in that. And so as we started walking in that, he started to release more. No, the community is just a small part of it. We're going to give you a city. Y'all got quiet when I said that. <laughs> I'm crazy enough to believe it now because of what I've seen him do up to this point. But if you had asked me three years ago, is God going to give you a city? I would be like, no. Why would he do that? That's crazy. But now I have the faith to believe because of what I've, I've seen him do up to this point. So we have to remember that no matter how great of a plan you think that you've conjured up in your mind and say that it's God, God is saying you're aiming way too low. I've got far more in store for you than you could ever imagine or think. And your capacity stops at a certain level. But we serve an unlimited God that he can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants. Yeah. Jesus, man, oh man, this is the God we serve. So we're, we're talking about these two individuals. Let me get back to the text. We're talking about these two individuals that was in the runnings for this one position, Barsabbas and Matthias. They both were next in line to fill the shoes as the next apostle due to the death of Judas. But only one of them could be selected to continue walking directly with the apostles who were with Christ from the day he was baptized until the day he ascended. 
So let, let's try to dissect this a little bit. There's two things that they did that we need to remember in this season as we begin pushing out the ministry that God has given you. Everyone here has a ministry. And this is a season where under the open heaven, guys, God is going to release you to do what God, what he has called you to do, whether it be with this ministry or somewhere else, wherever God. This is a season of release. Y'all hearing me? So there's two things that they did that we have to remember. The first thing they did was they recognized the need to fill the shoes of an imposter with someone who was familiar in character and discipline. See, Judas lacked character. He lacked discipline. But as a group, they still move with power. But it was the betrayal on the inside that taught them a lesson. They said, we have to select somebody to fill his shoes that we don't have to question their character and we don't have to question their discipline. How many of y'all know that when you break it down to that degree, it ain't but so many people you can pick from? <laughs> Let's just keep it real. Because if you don't have standards, you'll have a thousand people. You'll be doing interviews for weeks to fill one position. And you don't know what you're going to get. But when you boil it down and say, I need somebody with character. I need somebody with discipline. I need somebody who was there when he got baptized. I need somebody who walked with him, saw the miracles, saw his heart, saw the signs, saw the wonders. And I need somebody who was there when he ascended. I need somebody who's familiar in character, familiar in integrity, familiar in discipline, familiar in the plan that he left for us to accomplish when he said, go and, and make disciples of all nations. So they have open trials. <laughs> the second thing they did was they sought God. Just be, listen, listen, just because you feel good about somebody doesn't necessarily mean they're the one. Can I, did I say that the right way? Just because you feel good about somebody does not mean that they're the one. And sometimes we make decisions based on feelings. Come on, y'all. I feel good about this person because I like their smile. I like how they articulate. I like how they're well spoken. They're well dressed. They came in all every the resume got pretty flowers on it and all that stuff. Oh, come on. Y'all don't act like y'all never been there before. And so we, we look at all the natural stuff and we feel good about the natural stuff. Why? Because their natural appearance appealed to your natural appearance, your natural feelings. And so when their natural appearance appeals to your natural feelings, you're going to feel good about bringing that person on. But we got to get to a point where we see God on behalf of whoever is going to come into our circle. Because as you go into your ministry and do whatever it is that God has you doing, there's going to be a whole lot of people that's going to come to you that look the part. They're going to put on their best face because they want to impress you so they can get into your inner circle. But then you got to check the character. You got to check the integrity. Come on, somebody. And you got to seek God to make sure this is the right person for you. So what they ended up doing was they prayed. They prayed. They prayed. And I like this. What they ended up doing is they casted lots. I did this like we, like we come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Apostles out here shooting dice. <laughs> but <laughs> they casted lots. What does that do? When you cast lots, you're taking yourself out of the picture. We, we, we close the door to politics. Y'all hear me? We close the door to favoritism. We close the door to, to you saying, oh, I, you picked him because y'all grew up together. Or, or we close the door because, oh, you picked that person because that's your cousin. Yeah, we close the door to, oh, the reason why you picked them is because their daddy got money. Y'all, come on, somebody. We close the door to politics, and what they're doing is they're casting lots because they're saying that, God, we're putting all of this in your hands. Whatever you decide to do, whoever you decide to pick, we're just going to be all right with it. But that way, when the decision is made, can't nobody come back to us and say, oh, you picked them just because. Right. I love casting lots. I don't, I'm going to try it and see if it works. Hey, man, we might have to cast some lots. I don't know. What, if it don't go in my favor, I'm going to say it didn't work. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it real. I ain't that saved. I'm, I, 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 I got some work. I got some work to do. But, but, but what they ended up doing was they said, listen, we got to take ourselves out of this because when we're in the midst of it, we can let another Judas in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't want another Judas to come in. So we need to see God on how to handle this situation, who to let in. Because so you got Matthias over here who... 
He's, he's a man of God. He's, a, he's an apostle just like everybody else. He's, he's upstanding. He has a good reputation. There's nothing wrong with Matthias. And over here, you have Barsabbas, who actually, his last name is Justice. And Justice, back in that era, meant someone with distinguished integrity. So his name preceded him. He was a man of distinct integrity. So, wow, we got a man of God over here who has a clean record, a clean slate. He walked with us from the beginning. You got another man of God who was the same exact thing. They say that he has a distinct integrity. Who do we pick? One of them is not the right one. So we have to seek God on these things because you're going to have people come into your life where both of them look the bill. They both fit the bill. But only one of them is actually supposed to be in that position. Amen? Y'all with me? Amen. Amen. So I had to look deeper in this, and this is where, this is where we, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I was drawn to Barsabbas. Why was he not selected? So I started to get a little petty. All right, let me see where they're from. You know, I just talked about that a minute ago, right? I had to, let me see where they're from. Maybe that's got something to do with it. So I find out that Matthias is actually from Bethlehem. Y'all know where Bethlehem is? Y'all know who was born there? Okay, all right. All right, so Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Matthias is from Bethlehem. <laughs> you got that, right? He's from the tribe of Judah, Jesus' hometown. All right? They from the same hood. And we're going to say that they from the same hood. All right? So if he had an advantage over Barsabbas, it was that. Because Barsabbas was from Rome. He's from over there somewhere. So he's from Jesus' hometown. He's from a whole other country. Amen? So, so that was the first thing. I'm like, no, it's got to be more to it than that. It's got to be more to it than just where they're from. Now, I do understand that Jesus does have, he does do a little bit of favoritism. Just a little bit, but in a healthy way. Right? It's all according to the assignment that he has. Y'all remember he was walking through and a lady was trying to stop him yeah. for some help? He's like, hold up, hold up. I got business to take care of. What does your problem have to do with me? So there's a little bit in him, but it's because of an assignment that he has. And so, so in this manner, I noticed that I said, okay, maybe he was selected because he's from his hometown. But then I had to go a little deeper. Both men of God deserving of an increase of influence, but God chose a man from Bethlehem, even though Barsabbas' resume says he's a man of distinct integrity. All right. So the reality is, as we transition here, Barsabbas did not get the position, but he moved on. Okay? And God has something better lined up for him. He, was he mad, though? That's the question. We don't, we, I don't think he was because he's a man of integrity. So he realizes that God was in control. And even though he wanted, I mean, because think about it. At this time, the apostles is like the Beatles at their peak. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, you, why wouldn't you want to be one of the 12? You know what I'm saying? Why would you not want to be with the crew? Like, they, they, they're going from country to country. They're healing people. And as a Christian, you're like, man, that's, I'm, I'm motivated by that. I want to be where they are. So you have an opportunity to walk with the Beatles, if you will. But he didn't get picked. I don't know if he got upset or not, but I do know that he moved on with his life because he realizes that God is in control and God must have something better. Come on, somebody. For him. Mm -mm -mm. So he kept a good attitude. And I want to tell somebody before I transition about there's something about your attitude. Amen. That God can bless you if your attitude is right. If you don't get selected, you start pouting and acting a fool and you forget that you're still a child of God because you didn't get what you wanted. Then God can't bless you into the leadership role that he actually has set aside for you. You can't have no pouting leaders and saying I'm a child of God. Come on, somebody. So you got to get there. We, we got to have the right attitude. Even if we don't get selected, because we have to realize that not being selected does not mean that you're rejected. That's right. Mm, mm, mm. So what I've learned about this is that God had a plan for Basabas to become bishop over the city of, help me, help me with this here, Eleuthero, 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 Eleutheropolis. I've been struggling with that word all week, and I still ain't got it. Eleutheropolis. E U. I'm gonna spell it so that way y'all can mess it up too. Where is it? E L E U T H E R O P O L I S. Eleutheropolis. We call it Elu, the city of Elu, huh? Amen. Right. Um, 
And the city of Eleutheropolis, it means the city of free. Now, let me, let me tell you what God was, had in store for Barsabbas. Barsabbas wanted to walk with the twelve. With the other, uh, I'm sorry, with the other disciples. He wanted to be with them. He didn't get selected. God says, I have something greater for you. So as he did not get selected, he moved on, not realizing that God wanted him to be the bishop over the city of free. It's 13,900 acres of land in which the city was built only on 69 acres of it. The rest of it was farmland or income producing land. Y'all hearing what I'm saying here? So he wanted to walk with the 11, but God is saying, no, I'm giving you greater. I'm giving you more land. I'm giving you more territory. I'm giving you more influence. I'm giving you a position where you can thrive in because your gifting is in leadership. So it's 13,900 acres of land that God gave him to be the bishop over. Only 69 acres of it was, for, was built up as a city. So that other 13,831 acres was farmland to produce for income. Are y'all getting me on this? That's a lot of land that could produce income. <laughs> My God. It was known as the administrative hub of the region, which means all business flowed to and from this place. There are seven routes from other places that led directly to this city. Are y'all hearing me on this? Seven streams of income that came directly to Barsabbas. He didn't have to go anywhere. All he had to do would just be the presiding bishop. All of the income, all of the increase, all of the influence came to him. Wow. So he was appointed to be the bishop over this entire thriving land. God prospered him and gave him nearly 14,000 acres of land to rule over and govern. How many of y'all know if God can trust you with a city? I'm going to give you a city. A city with hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people. I'm going to entrust you to make the right decisions over it. Because you've made yourself known as a man or a woman of distinct integrity. And I know that I can trust you with much. See, you were faithful over a few things. Now I can make you ruler over many. And so he's given him the position of bishop. He's given him this city. He's given him over almost 14,000 acres of land. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I got to receive this for me right now because I, I don't know if y'all getting this, but from what he's downloaded into me and what I'm reading in this text, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to stay humble here, but I'm like, Lord, you just said you promised me a city. You, you promised me a city. So here I am. I'm, I'm like Barsabbas right now. I'm over here. I, there was times in my life where I got rejected. There was times when I wanted to be under a certain covering. There was times when I wanted to be in the mix with certain people. And God said no. And I took it as rejection. But now I realize that it was not rejection at all. It was denial because he has got something greater for me that he don't want them to get credit for. Amen. No, it's perfect. That's right. So, so what does all this mean? Somebody in here needs to know you've relied on your resume long enough. You, you've relied on your know-how long enough. You've relied on what you've accomplished long enough. And what God is saying, I'm going to position you in high places according to your obedience, your character, and your integrity. Because he's chosen you to do greater things than what you could ever imagine or think. And when you think about it, you look back and you think about what God's best was for you. Think about this. Do you really think that was all he's got for you? I mean, just really think about it. There's been plenty of times where I thought I knew God's best for me, what his best was for me. And now that I look back on it, I was crazy to think that that was all he could do in my life. So that's the same question I'm asking you. Do you really think that when you thought about what God's plan for your life is, as great as it was of an idea, do you really think that was his best for you? Do you really think that was the maximum to cut off the capacity that he has for you? Or was there greater? Or is there greater? Mm -mm -mm. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. And sometimes we got to realize that giving you what you want can stifle who you are. Sometimes giving you what you want 
can stifle who you really are. I can only imagine how, how uh, I say Bishop now, Barsabbas, how he would have been stifled at his calling because he would have been walking with the disciples instead of being the bishop over the city of free. Because he was built for greater. And sometimes when you're built for greater and you settle for good, it's uncomfortable. It's real uncomfortable. Come on, somebody. When you're built for greater, you settle for good. It's real uncomfortable to stay in good. And you get squeezed into this little box and you want to bust out of this box because there's so much more you feel like you should be doing. But the reality is, is you settled. That's why you're where you are. But God is saying, don't settle for good because I've created you to be great. Don't settle for success when I've called you to be prosperous. Did y'all get that one? Hey, maybe that one hit a little different. Yes. Don't settle for success when I've called you to be prosperous. There's a difference between the two because success is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Let's just keep it real. Like anybody can define success however they want to define success. Okay, well, I didn't make a million dollars, but I have a beautiful family. That's success. Other people could say, well, I got a beautiful family, but I'm broke. Yeah, everybody, you can define success however you want to, but prosperous ain't but one way to define prosperous. I'm blessed in the city, I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed in the comings, I'm blessed in the goings. I'm blessed when I lay down, I'm blessed when I wake up. I have an abundance no matter what is going on in my life, I'm never in lack and the Lord is with me. So there is no way that is subject to whatever you want to define it as. When you're prosperous, you're prosperous. Ain't nobody can tell you differently. But if you're successful, people can talk about what success is supposed to look like. But when you're prosperous, oh my God, when you're prosperous, can't nobody deny that. God says, I've called you to be prosperous, not successful. Because when you're prosperous, all of, not only will all your needs be met, all of your desires will be met. And not only will all of your desires will be met, but you'll have it all in excess. Amen. Your needs, your desires in excess. Yes. So church, let's stop selling for being successful. Let's aim for prosperous. One thing that I'm going to say, and I'm going to close. Barsabbas. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Barsabbas in here today. There's a lot of us in here today. We've all wanted something. We've all been told no. But God is saying, I'm about to move you. And when I move you, it's going to make sense. Why all this stuff that you had heard no for, all the stuff that was told no to you, all the opportunities that did not go your way, every single time when they chose somebody else instead of you, every single time that you had to go home, you crying at night because you felt like you weren't good enough, it's all going to make sense when I move you. Oh, God, it's going to make sense. So stop beating yourself up. Stop trying to make yourself better in an area where God didn't even call you to be in in the first place. Seek his face. Amen. Seek his face and where it is he wants you because you're good enough right now. Y'all yes. missed that. Yes. That's right. I think two of y'all got that. You're good enough right now because he's already equipped you to prosper where he wants you to be. So here you are trying to make yourself better in another place. And God is saying, I've already equipped you to prosper right here, right now. So you're good enough today to be prosperous. Yes. That's right. Jesus. All you have to do is wait for him to open the door for you to walk into your city of free. Yes. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And when God gets through with you, you're going to know the difference between better than what you have versus God's best. Yes. See, because sometimes we settle for better than what we have and we call that God's blessing. I don't know if y'all hearing what I'm saying right now, but this is better than what I have. So this must be what God has for me. This is because I, I was struggling back here, but I'm OK right now. So this must be God's best best. So I'm OK right now, but I'm doing better than I was yesterday. So this is God's best. God is saying, I'm going to show you when I get done with you, you're going to know the difference between better than what you have versus my best. Yeah. So we got to stop settling. What if I told you, you weren't called to be hired, you were called to do the hiring? 
Could you believe that? You have the faith to believe that? Yeah. You, you, you weren't called to be the employee. You were called to be the employer. You weren't called to move to a city. You were called to start a city. See, y'all putting limits on God. That's why y'all so quiet. Y'all putting limits on him. Y'all putting limits on him. Take the limits off. Take the limits off. Right. See, take the limits off. You weren't called to be the borrower. You were called to be the lender. Keep running to the bank to get loans. What if God is telling you, I want you to be the bank? I want you to be the one people come to when they need a loan. Isn't that in his word? If I'm not mistaken, that's in the word, right? You to be lenders and not the borrowers. Is that what he said? I'm crazy enough to believe it because it's in the book. What, what if he's telling you to stop looking at yourself as a subordinate? Can we think high enough? Can we take the lid off of what, what, what we were taught? Right? We were taught as kids, go get a job, pay your bills, right? Go on and get you that car that night that you work hard for, go get it. And now you in debt up to your eyeballs. And, you, and you, you can't even breathe without taking a loan out for extra oxygen. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? But God is saying, I, I, I've called you to be great. I've called you to be prosperous. So, so just because they said no, doesn't mean I've rejected you. My promise still stands that I have great for you. You just need to be still and know that I'm God. And stop sulking because you didn't get what you wanted. Because sometimes we blame God, and when we blame God for what we didn't get, what we're really saying is, you're not good enough for me. It, it's, it's, you're not good enough for me because I want this. But what God knows is that if I give you this, you're going to praise me for something that you're going to hate me for later. So I'm not even going to let you go down that road. I'm, I'm going to keep you from that. I don't care how you feel. You know, God is not about, he don't get all in your feelings, right? Can, can we keep it real? He don't get into all your feelings. He don't get into all that stuff. I'm not about your feelings. I'm about purpose. And if I get into your feelings, then we can't deal with purpose because feelings is going to derail you, take you this way when purpose is taking you this way. So God don't really care about all that, folks. Let's just we keep it real 100. Let's keep 100. He wants you to be in your purpose. So listen, folks, we're going to close on that note because I, I, I don't want to go too much further than what God has told me to say, that God has a way of turning the tables for your good. Just because you didn't get selected, some folk might look at you like, yeah, you really thought she was going to get that position? You, you really thought that that was, that was yours? I mean, I know you was praying and crying and snotting in the nose about all that, and, 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 and now folk laughing at you. But what God is saying is, you know, I, I still prepare tables in the midst of your enemies. I still do that. I still do that. And so God is getting ready to turn the tables on some of y'all's lives today. I'm going to say some of our lives today. I'm receiving that from me as well. The same people that you held in high esteem that you wanted to impress. The same people that you held in high esteem that you wanted to be like them. The same people that you held in high esteem that you wanted to be at their level. Come on, somebody. God is saying, I'm about to shift it. And these people, the same people are now going to be seeking you for counsel. These same people are going to be coming to you for advice. These same people are going to be looking to get, get hired by you. The same people. And it has nothing to do with you being all that. It has everything to do with God saying, this is where you belong. Amen. As a child of God, you're supposed to be seated in these places, not them. But I'm going to put you where you're going to thrive at so that way they have to come to you. Are y'all receiving something today? Yes. So there is a time when no is best for you. But how you handle the no's can elevate you to his yes and amen. Amen? Y'all give God some praise, y'all. <laughs> praise God. So in Acts 1, if you ever go back and read through it, I want you to take some time and really study what happened here. God protected a good man from a good position so that he could be a great man in a great position. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Are you coming up, sister? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. You have anything for me? Okay. All right. Cool. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This is what I want to do. I want to open up the altar right now. This is 
probably the most important part of what we're going to do today because some of us have believed we're not good enough for a very long time. You love God, you go to church, you understand God is in control, but deep down on the inside of you, there's a part of you that believes in second place. There, there, there's, you accept second place because you don't believe that you're great somewhere else in first place. And God is saying, we're gonna erase that today. We're gonna to fix that today because every child of God was created to be great in first place. You just got to figure out which lane it is. And so if there's anyone here today that says, you know what? I heard what you said and that touched me. I, I believe that I have purpose. I believe that there's something greater for me. I've, I've chased after, I've pursued all these different things because I liked them. They were hobbies. They were things that I really wanted to do. But for whatever reason, they never worked out. And here I am today, a little bit bitter, not really caring about God, because if God really existed, he would have gave me what I wanted way back then. No, 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 no. Wrong perception, wrong mindset. God has something greater for you than your hobby. He's got something greater for you than what it is you like to do. God has a purpose that will make your name great and place you before great men. If there's anybody here today that's saying, you know what, that's me. I, I want this relationship with God. I want this relationship with Jesus Christ. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. Because I, you got to recognize something. Relationship with the Lord is what's going to make you great. Apart from that, you're just going to be successful at best. But you won't prosper. You won't have a, a spot. You know, he's talking about I, I, in my mansion, I have many rooms. Come on, somebody. You want a room in heaven? When you pass on from here, you got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ first here on earth. There's no exception to that. And I know a lot of people teach differently, but the, the, the Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear that no one enters and comes to the Father but through me, Jesus Christ. So if you say, you know what, not only do I want to be prosperous here on earth, I want to have life eternally with Jesus Christ when I leave here. If that's somebody here today, go ahead and raise your hand where you are. Raise your hand where you are. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah. God is literally shifting things right now. I can see it happening in the spirit realm for you right now. I see it. I see it. As a matter of fact, even for you right now, I'm seeing another job opportunity for you. It literally just dropped when your hand came up and I'm seeing a pay increase for you. It, I'm literally I just saw this and I'm not. Y'all know I don't make stuff. I, well, when God showed me something, I share it. I saw another job opportunity coming for you and I saw an increase for you. So I don't know. You just expect a raise, expect a raise and expect another job opportunity. Amen. Because God is saying, listen, I can do all things, but I'm limited unless you're my child. Y'all know what I'm saying? Because in a neighborhood, there's only so much I can do with somebody else's kid. But when you become his child, he says, I can do whatever at this point. So God is saying, I'm knocking the lid off of everything in the name of Jesus and everything that has been held up. God is releasing it now in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So we're going to pray and I want you guys to repeat after me. Amen. Hallelujah. And everyone else, while you're here, if y'all don't mind, just pray silently. Amen. And just, just intercede.